Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm recording live from uh, the Reformed Forum studios in Grays Lake, Illinois. I'm delighted to be back with some friends. Let me introduce to you first. We have Lane Tipton, who uh, serves as pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania. And he's also a faculty member here at Reformed Forum. We couldn't be happier to have him with us. Uh, Welcome back, Lane. It's great to see you. Thanks, Camden. As always, unqualified delight to be here. Amen. We also have Glenn Clary. Glenn is the pastor of uh, Providence OP in Pflugerville, Texas. It's a little bit under the weather tonight, but I thank you, Glenn, for taking the time out this evening to join us, especially for this live stream. It's good to see you as well. You're welcome. Good to see you and pleasure to be here. Yes. And uh, Jeff Waddington, of course, is with us. He is uh, stated supply at Faith OPC in Fawn Grove, Pennsylvania, and he's uh, calling in from uh, Norristown, PA. Welcome back, Jeff. It's good to see you as yeah, always. It's good to be here. Well, we had a bit of a snafu uh, where we were working on some things and trying to get the live stream working. We, we are streaming live on Facebook. We were streaming live for about half an hour, but not everybody's audio was going to Facebook. So now it seems as if it's working. We are recording. And it's a special evening uh, as we are broadcasting live. And it's special, at least for me. I'm very thankful uh, for my friends to be joining uh, with me tonight for a book launch. We're going to be talking today about uh, this book, Carl Rahner in the Great Thinkers series from PNR Publishing. Very thankful to have worked with them. And this uh, began with a dissertation that I wrote for... um, my PhD. And uh, over the years then, sitting on it and improving it and uh, turning it more into readable book form, uh, we now have it here released as of today when we're recording, Monday, December 2nd. So you can get the book online at various places. Uh, I encourage you to check out prpbooks.com. I think it's .com. might be .org. I should check that link. Uh, And you can get a direct price on it, uh, a really good price, prpbooks.com slash book slash Carl dash Ronner is one place. You can also uh, get the link in the episode description to this episode. So I'm going to hand things off after having done the normal introductions and uh, saying hi to everybody. But um, since I wrote the book, I suppose I'm going to pass things off to Lane Tipton, who's going to to run point for us tonight. So thanks so much, Lane. Thanks for bearing with us through the technical issues. I'm uh, happy to be here today and give things over, hand things over to you. You bet. Well, all of us are probably going to be joining in and asking questions, but Camden, would you orient everyone? What interested you initially in pursuing a project oh. on the theology of Karl Rahner? What, what grabbed your attention about him? Yeah, that's a good question, and you know the answer to that, but thanks for, for tossing me one to, to hit. Um, I started studying Karl Rahner because I heard his name mentioned in your Doctrine of Christ class. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd been introduced to Rahner more generally speaking through a distance course I took on cassette tape by Harvey Kahn. Uh, and he taught this like encountering world missions or something that was the name of the course. And I took it through the International Studies Institute or Theological Institute. And um, I took three classes at Westminster before actually moving to, to Philadelphia, and that was one of them. So it sounded as if uh, Dr. Kahn had a, one of those old tape recorders, you know, those flat ones, you know, that had the play button, but then the record button <laughs> built into the play button, that orange little, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yep. Oh, yeah. yep. It sounded like he had one of those in a closet and just was talking to it by himself in the dark, it sounded like. <laughs> yes, and, it was. And he would, and he, it gets better because he would also tell jokes, which he were... Would. Weren't that funny? But he laughed hysterically it, at his own, at his own jokes. jokes. That's right. <laughs> that was Harvey. But that was him in class as well. Uh, to, he was that way. So I, that was my intro to Carl Rahner, and we'll talk about why a little bit later. That was specifically on his doctrine of anonymous Christianity. But you, um, when you spoke about Rahner and his Christology from a modern Roman Catholic position, that got me thinking, and I was connecting more dots. And um, you, Lane, you have this uh, exam question, um, you did, <laughs> where you uh, asked us, yeah, I know, uh, where you used to ask uh, your students to, uh, the last question, you knew it was coming because you had to do work ahead of time to work on an unorthodox or heterodox Christology and then write about it on the final exam. So I chose Karl Rahner as an example, um, and, and uh, that got me studying him. But I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here the, in 
get to the to the meat of it, but what when I was reading Rahner, I found him fascinating, and I'm not just interested in modern theology in general or reading heterodox theologians, unorthodox theologians just in general. I don't find that particularly interesting just in general. But with Rahner, it seemed quite interesting to me because he spoke uh, a lot of the same words. He used a lot of the same vocabulary as Cornelius Van Til, whom I love so dearly. And he asked a lot of the same, many of the same theological questions. But the answers he came up with were almost diametrically opposed to the Westminster tradition or the more general reform tradition that I had come to know and cherish as being that which is based upon Scripture, you know, having the, you know, teaching the system of doctrine which is contained in the Bible. So that got me to thinking why uh, and how could Rahner come from what seems like an initial starting point, and you know, at least in terms of the questions he's asking, and arrive at entirely different answers. And, you know, if you just found some random person that thought that, maybe it wouldn't be so interesting. But also when you couple the fact that Rahner is perhaps the most influential Catholic, Roman Catholic theologian of the 20th century, he's at least in the top three. And you put Benedict up there. Um, uh, and, you know, a f- bunch of other people might vie for that top three spot as well. But Rahner's in the mix. And so if he's such a huge figure so influential in contemporary Roman Catholicism seems to cover a lot of the same ground as people in our reform tradition, but yet nobody except Robert Strimple has done anything scholarly on Karl Rahner. That, that really led me to, to say, this is probably somebody I need to look into and at least for the sake of the church should do some heavy lifting, try to understand him on his own terms and then try to offer a reformed critique and so that that's really what got me going, and it was is because of your suggestion, really. Well, as you as you began to read him, and as you've written this book, if you were asked the question, um, what's what 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 is Rahner best known for? What makes him worthy of engagement uh, for Reformed theologians, people pursuing the deeper Protestant conception? Um, what what would stand out? What's he what's he known most for? And um, what 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 are we going to have to engage most basically when we when we mm-hmm. uh, wrestle with Rahner? Yeah, well, the big doctrines you usually hear about with Karl Rahner are Rahner's rule or his Trinitarian axiom, uh, and his doctrine of the anonymous Christian. So we can unpack that. Um, you know, and a little bit later, but the Trinitarian axiom or Rahner's rule is the imminent Trinity, that's with an A, immanent Trinity, is the economic Trinity and vice versa. So he's equating uh, God as he is in himself with God as he's revealed unto us. He says there's not two Trinities. There's not an, in our terms, we would say the ontological Trinity and the economic Trinity. He says there aren't two Trinities, an ontological one and then an economic one. They're the same. And uh, that's his axiom, which is very, very common and popular in contemporary theology. Uh, that, that's almost a given for a lot of people to, especially within social Trinitarian circles, but I wouldn't say Rahner is a social Trinitarian. And then Rahner's doctrine of anonymous Christianity, which says that um, it's not exactly universalism, but it's inclusivism, so which is different from exclusivism. We would say that Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven by which we may be saved, and we must believe upon him for salvation. And we believe upon Jesus Christ for salvation. We receive his righteousness and we die into sin, and we're raised up in union and communion with him. Uh, that's the gospel, you know, and people who are not united to Christ and people who do not profess faith in him and trust in him for their salvation, they're not saved. And we pray that they would be, but that that's what we believe the, the teaching of Scripture is. The inclusivist is quite different because the inclusivist is different from the universalist because they're saying, well, there are people that are saved and there are people who aren't saved, but you could be saved by Christ and not know it is basically the idea of the inclusivist. So Rahner would say that salvation happens through the church, and he would say that's the Roman Catholic Church with the Pope as its head, uh, as the vic- well, the Pope as the vicar of Christ, Christ being the head of the church, and the church being the continuing incarnation of Christ in history. But you could find uh, Muslims, you can find Hindus, you can find avowed atheists who 
may indeed be saved and may be experiencing the grace of Christ outside of the church. It's from the church, but they don't. maybe they don't even know it. So it's possible to be an anonymous Christian, and I can explain why and how that works and why that makes sense in Ronner's theology, perhaps in a, in a few minutes. But those are yeah. the two big things. And then you, you, to wrestle with him, you're going to have to get, get down to foundational levels. Because, you know, in, in many ways, like many modern theologians, like figures like Karl Barth, for example, he might, they might be speaking in terms that sound rather orthodox, but unless you dig down deep, you're not going to recognize that the, he's built a theology on a completely different foundation from what we're familiar with. Right. And as you mentioned that, uh, you, you've talked about the foundations of Rahner and trying to get to the core of the system that Rahner's proposing. A lot of people, uh, when they read your excellent book, might be thinking this is a handbook that outlines all the basic doctrines of Karl Rahner and right. just gives you a kind of encyclopedic uh, entry of them. But in, you take right. a different approach. Mm -hmm. And I think the approach that you take makes this book very useful and very unique. Could you explain the mm. structure of the approach that you take in this in this book and why you chose not to write it as a kind of encyclopedia entry on uh -huh. basic doctrines that Rahner affirmed? Or didn't yeah, you? no, thanks for that. I, that's very intentional, the way I wrote the book and structured it, and I thought it would be of greater service to the church ultimately. Now, there are many other books that are introductions to the theology of Karl Rahner, and they're they're going to do a better job of that than I can because they're written by people who are, you know, Catholics and very sympathetic to his theology. And so you don't need to write another one of those books and just make it make it worthwhile just because a reformed person wrote it. It doesn't make sense for me to duplicate somebody else's book. So that's one reason why I didn't want to do that. But, you know, you might expect in a book in a series like this on great thinkers that, oh, well, let's flip open and there's a chapter on anonymous Christianity. And then there's another chapter on the doctrine of the Trinity. And when you go there, it's just, you know, very descriptive nuts and bolts. Well, here's his doctrine. Here, you know, here's the abstract version, <laughs> you know, the synopsis, you know. And, and that can be useful to have dictionaries of theology or encyclopedias of theology. But I wanted to do something more than that because if you, if you try to pull Rahner's doctrines out of their context and just understand them, you know, if you're looking for a Cliff's Notes version, you're not going to understand what he's really saying. You're going to be able to repeat it at a cocktail party, at least if you go to those kinds of cocktail parties, <laughs> right, guys? They're talking about stuff like that. But and you're going to sound like you know what you're talking about, you know. You're, but you're you're basically at best going to get like a PhD comprehensive exam level understanding, <laughs> which is like you know. Uh, it's like a book report, right? Like I can regurgitate to you something somebody said, but I'm not going to own it. And so I wanted to write a book where you could, honestly, you could re pick this book up, read the first chapter and the last chapter, and it would, I think, be really useful to you. And the whole case is laid out in the first chapter and the last chapter, like everything in a summary form. So if you need something really fast, you can read the book that way. But if you want to understand things really deeply and to, to get a hold on what Rahner is actually doing, and then really understand the true genius and the insight of his theology. I disagree with it vehemently, but if you really want to understand why he's such a formidable foe to the, to the Reformed Church and the Reformed faith, you have to get into it, and then you see the whole system. A lot of Rahnerians would really reject the idea that Rahner's a systematic theologian, but that's because they have very technical views on what dogmatics is versus ethical theology versus philosophical theology and stuff. So Rahner's not a systematician in that kind of sense. He's not doing traditional dogmatic theology in the form that they know and understand. And in many ways, he's very critical of that. He calls it textbook or Densinger theology, named after a very classic uh, book on, on the orthodox or traditional Catholic doctrines. But what Rahner does is present I believe, a very sim singular project. He has a very simple root concern, a basic question of existence that he carries on from beginning to end, and it goes through all the different loci or the different departments of theology. And that question really is, who is mankind and how is God communicating himself to mankind? And what's the future of that relationship? So in many ways, that question is the same question we want to ask 
in terms of the deeper Protestant conception, in terms of you know, classic Orthodox traditional and confessional covenant theology. That's, that's, that is the question. Who are we and why are we here? And what's the future of our relationship to God? You know, And so Rahner asked that basic question, but that question drives everything else. And so I think if you, if, you, if you start with that question and then you begin where he begins, you know, the doctrine of God, and then starts to unfold that through all the different loci, like a doctrine of man, uh, doctrine of Christ, his doctrine of grace, uh, and you move on through all of those things, then you come to see when you return back to his, his Trinitarian axiom or you return back to the anon- doctrine of the anonymous Christian, it's almost as if the cursory analyses are not even talking about the same thing because you understand it so much more deeply. It's not really hard to understand either when you really unpack it, but not a lot of books are treating Rahner with this kind of thoroughgoing, organic polemic. And that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, so so with regard to the, the, the major or big project that Rahner's after, if you were going to try to start giving a description of the kind of nuclear structure of what Rahner's after. Uh, you, in in the volume, you begin on, um, uh, and and people I think would find this very illuminating. You begin with Trinitarian personhood, yeah, right. move to the recipients of grace, then to the hypostatic union, and then you you develop some implications and 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 so on. Where would you, if if you were going to distill the big project that Rahner's after and the, the mm-hmm. answer that he's giving to the question, what is man, mm-hmm. that makes him distinctive, where, mm-hmm. where, where, would, where would you direct us and well, how would do, Rahner answer that question? You do need to start. So that that is the big question. How does God communicate himself? How does God give the gift of himself? So if I can remember off the top of my head, my dissertation was titled The Triune Gift of Self. Carl Rahner's Doctrine of Divine Self-Communication, or a critique of Carl Rahner's Doctrine of Divine Self-Communication. So this is this is a, a much better version of that work. <laughs> it's missing a couple chapters from the dissertation, but they don't really need to be there. Um, and it has other material that's been revised and refined. And so you have to start with Rahner, uh, at least with personality. And God is three persons subsisting in one essence. So he doesn't deny any of the orthodox formulations. He wants to hold to to uh, Nicaea, to Constantinople, um, to orthodox uh, Christianity as as we know it. But then he adds a lot to it and he tweaks it. And Rahner's really greatly in debt to the Eastern Church. I know Trinitarian theology really was forged in the Eastern Church, and Glenn can speak to that. Well, any of you, any of you three can. Uh, but um, you know, it developed in different ways after the split, specifically uh, in 1054. Um, but Rahner really begins with the doctrine of the persons of the Godhead, because that's the center in terms of willingness, intentionality. It's, it's who God is. And if God is going to give the gift of himself, he needs to express himself. That's kind of how Rahner views things. Um, and God, if God is going to do that, then you have to know who God is in terms of three persons in one essence. And then you also have to know who's, who's he trying to communicate to. And, and that's why the chapter two is the recipients of grace. So if I can jump ahead a little bit, the, the, you know, where we're going, at least in, in the basic structure, is that uh, humankind, humanity, is a specifically divinely created uh, entity you know, human beings are divinely created specifically as the recipients of God's grace. And when I'm saying grace, I'm speaking in a very specific way for Rahner. Ultimately, the ultimate grace that is given is God's gift of himself. It's his, it's his own being. And so human beings, I like to use this illustration, are like a radio. And I know younger people don't even really know what radios are, how they work. Be, and, and you know, back in the day with the with the analog radio, we had a, actually had a, a knob that you had to turn to to finally tune the radio to the signal. You used to go through all the frequencies until you got to the station you wanted, and then you you know, depending on how good your radio was, you'd always you know move a little bit one way or the other and trying to get it just right. Well, human beings are like a radio, the actual device, and God is like the antenna sending out his signal, and he sends it to the whole world. 
but human beings are the radio that is specifically tuned exactly to that frequency. And in this case, it's actually a twofold frequency that human beings are able to receive God's communication of himself. And that comes back to Trinitarian theology because Son and Spirit are the modes by which the Father sends that out. So if kind of like the, the Father's the radio station or the operator and the signals that are getting sent, it's a twofold, like a two, dual band signal that is um, Son and Spirit, uh, historical or concrete and spiritual. So his doctrine of humanity is, is explicitly linked with his Trinitarian theology. And uh, that, I, I imagine for some people, their minds are already working and starting to see how the Trinitarian axiom, the imminent Trinity, or God in himself, is the economic Trinity and vice versa, how that fits now with um, his doctrine of humanity and how that might lead into the doctrine of the anonymous Christian. Yes, yes. How, how um, brothers, uh, Glenn and Jeff, I don't want to dominate on questions. Do you have anything you'd like to ask here? Uh, as... uh, the, the one question I had uh, going back to the Trinitarian, uh, the idea that the Father is self communicating by way of the Son and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, are you saying that Rahner's notion is that the Father is the God in a different way than the son and the spirit. Yeah. Now you're getting to the, to the real heart of it, like to the, to the polemic. And this is where my ears perk up when, especially somebody who's cut his teeth on reformed Trinitarian theology, especially within the more recent tradition of Herman Bovink, uh, Charles Hodge, and, you know, our favorite uh, Cornelius Van Til, Van Til is very much dependent on on Bavink and Voss, of course, too. And now with the Reformed Dogmatics being available, we see that he's right in the mix, too. So uh, Ronard um, will say that God is three persons in one essence, and they're consubstantial. He won't outright deny anything with ecumenical right. theology, to his credit. But at the same time, he is very Eastern, and Eastern theology has something of a priority where the father is the original God because he's unbegotten. Son and spirit are derivative. Now, they're not going to say that there's a time period in between whenever the father exists and then sometime later the son exists. So it's not, it's not even a, a better form of Arianism, for example. Um, you know, Rahner says they are consubstantial, but he's very Eastern in, sense of, in the sense of um, the the father being not only the source of the son's uh, personality, but also, in a sense, being the source of the son's divinity and the spirits as well. So, he, Rahner would be very much. I think Thomas has a view to that account, and and many others. So that that in itself is not outside the Catholic small C tradition. Right. No, that would. That, but I it's understand very. That no, I'm not saying. Yeah, but but right. you know that's very different from Calvin and all of his followers. So is he? Why why is it? Does he see the necessity of grounding the what I would call the divinity and the personality of the triune Godhead in the Father as opposed to the three? Oh, well, that's interesting. I, uh, yeah, I could venture a guess, but I, was, I will at least say that, it, that it's convenient to do that for ecumenical reasons. And I won't, I won't say that that's exactly um, that these are the, his conscious uh, driving concerns. We haven't mentioned the history, but Rahner's dates are 1904 to 1984. So he's, he's passed away, but he was a, a huge key theologian at, at Vatican II, which is 1962 to 1965. And he went into the council uh, being on the censored list. And then at, at the council, he was invited to come by uh, uh, Cardinal Koenig and, um, and became a, a theological expert. They had this position of paratus, like you could be a, a council expert. He was invited and he was a council expert. And I think most people would have to agree, I hope, that they would see that what came out of Vatican II and all of its declarations and constitutions is very much in harmony with Rahner's theology. So there's a debate about whether Rahner influenced the council or whether it's just in the milieu. But I would I would say it would be almost, in my opinion, impossible to say that there's a there's a sharp wedge between Vatican II theology and Rahner's. Okay, back to the point though. 
Why? Why would it be convenient to prioritize the father? For ecumenical reasons, Rahner has this um, this really important article he wrote, which he talks about oneness, and he talks about uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And I footnote, footnote that quite a bit in the, the chapter on the Trinity. Um, and he comes down on the side of saying that, that um, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are worshiping the same God. There's no difference. But they worship him come somewhat in slightly different ways. So really, the Muslim worships one true and living God. They just don't have the doctrine of the Trinity. And Karl Rahner says, you know, that's basically the same thing. They're worshiping the same being. And it's not that far off because we also believe in, in the Father. They're just not getting the communicative side of things. And so it's convenient to tone down, you know, to order things that way because you don't have diversity being, you don't have the three persons being equally, equally ultimate. Right. There, there's a logical priority of the Father in his view. And that's not unknown to our tradition. And, oh, I, and I say it's a deficiency in our tradition where people have done that. But Rahner definitely has a, a father-centered view of the Trinity. And Son and Spirit are consubstantial. Nevertheless, they are divine right. self-communications. Eternal self-communications at that, but they're, they're ultimately right, but that seeking their, their home does seem to, I, I It seems to reflect, given his uh, uh, somewhat... Um, commitment uh, to Thomism, it, it does seem to manifest a nature-grace distinction, doesn't it? So if you think of the Father as nature and the Son and the Spirit as grace, mm. it's not. I'm sure it's not that neat and clean, no, right. but, but you can see that distinction working itself out in the very way that the, the three persons of the Godhead relate to each other. Yeah, or vice versa. I, I, I mean, we'll, I don't think Rahner would want to pair things that way, but he, the grace that he wants to, to distribute to humanity is what Rahner calls uncreated grace. And that's, that's, a for, that's, that's a term that's within the Catholic tradition, and it's different from created grace. It's not the grace of sanctification. It's not a healing grace, but it's an elevating grace that is the gift of God's self. And so the Father, in that sense, is more closely identified with that grace because he is the unoriginate. Right. person. He's unbegotten. But then Son and Spirit are modes by which the Father communicates himself. So he sees the begottenness and he sees the procession um, as, you know, uh, ways in which that, that grace is being sent out. And so that's why he has this, this, this uh, identification of the imminent with the economic trinity, because by nature of the Son's begottenness and the Spirit's procession, those are, that's an economy. Right. So that's what explain he thinks. the relationship of the persons of the Godhead to one another and the, and how they relate both internally in, in say, to use the Latin, and then extra nos as God relates to us. So there's a, he's wanting to, like Thomas, wanting to, to, to have a very clear and close connection between the processions internally uh, and the uh, and then the missions that are external, right? In the economy of redemption, they're, yeah. they're, the 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 missions, if I understand right, ref mirror. Would that be the right way to describe mirror the internal? Oh, processions? even more. I would say I'd say even stronger. I would say that they are the the concrete expressions of that, and okay. I think that is where uh, where people go wrong when they unduly criticize Rahner as either a social Trinitarian or as a, um, a process theologian or an open theist, or even as a, just a, just a bald modalist. Right. He's not, but in, and then people say, well, you know, if the, if the economic Trinity is the imminent Trinity, then God could change because the economy is in relation to creation where we could say, well, God requires creation in order to exist. Well, there might be some, some cracks in Rahner's, thinking in some ways in which we would push him, but at least on this, he he wants to identify the processions and the missions. Now, they're not exactly the same thing, but the missions or the, um, the son's activity, we're going to, we should get to this soon, but the incarnation of the son, that has to happen. <laughs> but the incarnation is, 
in a sense, the concrete manifestation of the son's begottenness and, and his being sent by the father. And same thing with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit's procession, when it is distributed and given in, um, to humanity, that itself is the other way in which God gives a gift of himself. So you really have this kind of, you know, Christ being the concrete historical expression in his, in his humanity, and then the church, you know, and our human natures being united to him is a, like, a, like a little copy of the hypostatic union. Right. And then we have, because the church is the, the uh, ongoing incarnation of Christ in the Catholic theology, and then the Holy Spirit's activity uh, is that. So we get, we get both sides of God in his mind, because God eternally is expressing himself. The Father is ex- eternally expressing right. himself in two ways, and that's eternal. But then in history, we receive that which is eternal in concretized fashion. Right. Does he talk in terms of the left and the right hand of God at all? Uh, I... I, that's not ringing a bell. I, okay, I the don't reason I ask is Amos, but... Amos Young, the Pentecostal uh, evangelical theologian, builds off of Rahner and Bernard yeah. Lonergan, the Canadian uh, Roman Yeah, Catholic. Transcendental Thomas, too. Yeah. Right, another another Transcendental Thomas. Mm-hmm. So the big, the big project, which you are very good at, at, at unpacking in the book, is God's self-communication to the human creature with the goal— of the beatific vision. Yeah. Right? That's the end goal. Yeah. So really, if you think about it, the, the end of the process, if you will, is, is the beatific vision. And so that, in a sense, if you think of it teleologically, drives the whole project, right? It does. And, and in many ways, it connects us to what we were talking about with Dr. Uh, Lawrence Feingold and, yes. and uh, Dr. Dominic Legg well, was it last summer. Yes. Not this most recent so summer, the summer before, with the exitus and reditus. Glenn, maybe you could speak to that, but you know, you lectured on that, and at least with uh, regard to the sacramental theology, that when God creates, it's kind of uh, all things proceed from Him, but the goal of that is that they would eventually return unto Him. And the debate that we have with with Orthodox, well, I shouldn't say Orthodox, but the debate that we have with traditional confessional Catholic theology is the way in which they describe that return. And Rahner would definitely start to lean into deification and divinization and theosis themes, whereas I would want to couch things in terms of a covenantal image conformity more within a confessional reformed understanding of, of uh, glorification. And so, yeah, you're right. The, goal, the end goal is that, that uh, humanity would receive the beatific vision, but that's kind of uh, the return of humanity back up into the Godhead. You know, so that right. so God expresses Himself out to humanity, and they return unto Him and kind of merge, in 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 one way, shape, or form. So, uh, Glenn, do you have any uh, questions there? Uh, well, just, yeah, just a couple. Um, you 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 men have mentioned Thomism and transcendental Thomism. I wonder if you can distinguish <laughs> those two for us, uh, yeah. Camden. <laughs> I know you you explained it in your book uh, very clearly, but for well, I don't know how clear. Yeah, let me let me remember what I wrote, clear, brother. Very clear. <laughs> I should let me just before you get into that, I want to say that the book is beautifully, it really is beautifully written. That's um, kind of you. And Thank I'm you. not. I I've I agree. only read snippets. You know, I've read the only full thing I've read by Rahner is his book on the Trinity. The small yeah. and it's a very small book. That's right? an important it, one. It's, yeah. Yeah. I've read that. That's the only thing I've read. So this was this was eye opening for me, but it's so well written and so easy to follow that I, I know that the ease with which it is read indicates the sweat that you put into writing it. Mm. Uh, and and I know and all the hair I've lost, right? <laughs> and all the hair. You've... <laughs> so, anyways, uh, back to to, uh, to Glenn. Yeah. Well, transcendental Thomism is one of those things where. I'm going to give all the all the listeners a little heads up. That's another one of those things where you read about that in the handbooks. I don't have my Livingston Fire Enzer around here. It's in, it's back there somewhere. But, 21st Christianity into the right. And those books are tremendous. I love those books. And there's there's two volumes, and they're really handy if you if you need like a scholarly version of a Wikipedia entry on somebody. <laughs> And honestly, and you can learn a tremendous amount. And I've gone back over the years many, many times to reread the, the entry on Rahner, which is several pages, you know, and a lot of material in there. And I don't disagree with what they're saying. But 
you know, so I, I, I'm thankful for that, that the more I've studied Ronner and realized, no, this is a reliable resource. So it, it leads me to, to, to rely on many of their other entries. But transcendental Thomism is one of those things that you'll often hear tossed around. But it, at least the people that are studying Ronner quite a bit, and, and I imagine Lonergan and others, it's kind of this label that gets cast on a group of people, but it's not used by those people themselves, you know? So it, it's it's one of those things where you can kind of tell, Here's and here's the dirty little secret. If people are using that phrase a lot, you kind of probably know they're probably not studying this stuff much themselves. They probably heard this stuff from someone else. So anyway, that's my that's my little my little barb. It's but um, but it's not it's not entirely out of the realm of of usefulness, because what happened was um, if I get my dates right, I think it was eighteen seventy nine. Uh, the Pope uh, declared a bunch of things, <laughs> but one of them is where he announced that uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas's philosophy was the official philosophy of the Church. And of the Catholic Church, and and from their perspective, that's the true Church. And so, what you end up with is over the years to be a card carrying Catholic, to be in the good graces and a good position with the magisterium, you have to be Thomistic. There's, you don't have an option, right? There's just no choice. That's the official philosophy. But what happened was there, you know, for various reasons, and you can people can read about the history and the development of doctrine uh, in the Roman Catholic Church throughout the 20th century, leading up to the the 40s and 50s, especially. Uh, there are a whole host of other questions that people are wrestling with because of modernism. And in 1910, uh, you know, this parallels the the history of the Presbyterian Church in ways because in 1910, the the Pope also also issued an anti-modernist oath, in which every single person who is ordained any Catholic priest uh, has to disavow modernism. So you can't be a modernist and you have to be a Thomist philosopher. But there are many creative theologians and other people wanting to have the freedom to explore new ideas and new constructs for addressing theological challenges of contemporary age, but they have these strictures upon them. And so what happened was that people started to reinterpret Thomas, <laughs> right? So you have to be a, Tom, a Thomist philosophically to abide by what the church has said, but they didn't exactly tell you precisely how to be a Thomist. And so what you have is, and again, this is oversimplified, but you basically have a Kantian in, interpreted Thomas, so a transcendental Thomism where they're they're importing the categories of modernistic theology and liberating themselves from the strictures of the old and dead Thomism. Right. And so the through that scholasticism, right? Or is yeah. that a response to transcendental? Uh yeah, it's even a response to neo scholasticism because they did a lot of people at the Catholic Church didn't want uh, necessarily to deal with that. That so it's beyond that. Right. Um, right. And so Thomas, uh, you know, they're still able to abide by him. And Rahner uses Thomas quite a bit, especially in his epistemology in talking about phantasms and all these other things. And I encourage people to check out the Aquinas 101 class on YouTube. It's it's a free course. You can watch all the videos. And uh, even in those early series, they're talking about how, how we know. And, and they talk a little bit about that, how the human mind will go out and will extract uh, a phantasm off of the form that is in a thing. And so Rahner talks a lot about that, but then he, he uses the categories of, of Kant and especially of Heidegger and other continental theologians to recast everything that, Ron, that, that Thomas uh, had been addressing. And so he and others did that, Lonergan's another. So that's what transcendental Thomism is. So it's, it's really, it's really not Thomism. <laughs> <laughs> right. So <laughs> it's it's a mixed bag. Yeah. So, so Camden, if I can uh, maybe uh, to put a fine point on some of what you've been saying Please. here, much of what you've been saying, if we can narrow our focus for just a minute on the incarnation. Please, yeah. How significant is the incarnation oh. for Rahner's uh, theology as a whole? What is it that happens? in the incarnation, in the hypostatic union. Yeah, this and, this really gets to it. I'm, go ahead, finish your, your question. I, I don't want to miss something. Well, you know you know where I'm going with this, just the you know Trinitarian personality right. of God 
and the communication, self-communication of God to man as right. a recipient of uncreated grace, how does that come to its fulfillment and fruition oh, in the incarnation? Yeah, of that's that's really um, the, the incarnation the is the definitive acceptance of God's gift of himself. And so Rahner um, is an existentialist of a sort. And so another very important thing to Rahner in his humanity, in his doctrine of humanity, his doctrine of man, is this notion of freedom. And and freedom is there not just for God, but also for humankind. So both sides have to be free entirely for them to have a true personal exchange. So he's going to reject, you know, any notion of like concursus or total depravity, things like that, that we have as Calvinists. And, and as an existentialist, he's going to want to say that, yes, humanity, humans have to say yes to God in order to receive that gift. God wants to give the gift of himself, but humanity has to receive it. Now, if you have radical freedom on the divine side and the human side, there is a possible world, to use an analytic construct, in which humanity, every last one of them, rejects God's offer, right? right? And so that can't happen because there's a bigger problem involved, because the incarnation is not understood explicitly, or I should say exclusively, in redemptive categories. We have our traditional understanding of the incarnation and penal substitutionary atonement, everything is bound up with our doctrine of the covenant of works, the fact that humanity sinned, Adam fell into sin, and all of his posterity who descend from him by ordinary generation have fallen under the curse. And we need a redeemer of humanity. We need Jesus Christ to come as the seed of the woman, as a true man, but also as true God to uh, live a perfect life for us, satisfying the terms of that first covenant of works, that, that only covenant of works, and then to die for us in order to pay the penalty that we, that we owe, and then to be raised from death to triumph over the grave and then grant to us his righteousness and his life. So it, that's just the gospel. But for honor, the, 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 the incarnation is not remedial, and it is not something that happens in order to redeem us. It does redeem us, but the incarnation is ontological in the sense that it kind of bridges the gap between God and humanity, because we now have in the person of Christ the God-Man, and then the Church is the is the new humanity. Like is it's a it's a hypostatic union. You, me, all of us who are in Christ are in Rahner's scheme hypostatically united to God. Now it's a small H small you, it's not the same exact thing that happened for Christ, but because we're part of the church and the body of Christ, etc., that's what that's what he views. So uh, when the Son becomes incarnate, he is the definitive yes uh, to God's gift of himself. So in Christ, Christ becomes both the ultimate divine offer and the ultimate human acceptance in his very personhood. So it it locks in history the reception of this gift so that it can never be undone. It's irrevocable. And then the incarnation becomes what Rahner calls a real symbol. It's just spelled real, looks like R-E-A-L, real symbol, all one word. And the incarnation becomes this real symbol, which not only signifies that divine offer and the human acceptance, but also intensifies it. I, I might have used this in the book. I've used it in the past, but it's like a, an embrace, a hug or a kiss between a man and a wife. Um, it is a symbol of their affection for one another, a sign, a visible sign of their union, their marriage, but it also intensifies their relationship because you embrace your wife. You, you know, you, you, you have those loving feelings, et cetera, and it kind of it moves your relationship forward in a sense. So the incarnation is is not only a sign of divine offer and human acceptance, it's also a, an intensifier of it, and it advances it even more. Now that, that sounds to me, as you've explained it here and also in the book, that that the incarnation is remedial, but it's not the it's not a remedy to a sin problem, an ethical problem, but to an ontological problem. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Because it's necessary apart from the fall into sin. Right. right. And so in that regard, it is kind of remedial. But it's not remedial in a sense of there having been something bad, but something um, lacking or deficient. 
And that gets into, of course, a lot of nature grace issues regarding uh, Catholic theology, where humankind is created not sinful, but they are created with concupiscence. They have concupiscence, which is um, ultimately a drift towards self-love. Um, it's not itself sin, but it leads to sin. And so they they would place the problem here, the mystery here in, in man being created with, you know, concupiscently. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. Anyway. But there seems to be a problem with man as man. Yeah, that's what I mean. Such that so right, we, he, right. we would see the problem, uh, you know, saying that, that that's an issue because then God created man deficient somehow right. towards self-love. And analogously, it looks as if in Ronner's scheme, something's wrong with man. We need to have an incarnation in order to fix him or to bring him closer to God. So it, it, it kind of seems that way. But it's not. Um, Ronner wouldn't see it in terms of moral categories. I don't think it's, it is ontological. It, yeah. it also yeah. it also seems to me that uh, if I've understood Ronner correctly, um, that the eternal procession of the Son necessitates his incarnation. The incarnation is the concrete expression of that eternal ex- uh, procession. But that seems to me that creation is would be necessary. Um, God's triune personality makes creation necessary so that the um, incarnation can give a concrete expression to the eternal procession of the sun. Is that fair or not fair? Yeah, that's. I think that's right, and that's fair. But the concrete expression of it is not necessary on its own terms. God, God isn't incomplete at least according to Ronner, I would see that if God is trying to communicate the gift of himself, he needs to do that. There needs to be a recipient. And so I don't think Ronner's Trinitarian theology could bear the weight of what he wants to do. But Ronner would not see the concrete expression of the incarnation being necessary in order for God to actualize himself. However, it is necessary in order to guarantee that once humanity exists, that they would indeed receive this offer. So it's it's kind of uh, contingently necessary. I'd put it that way. Camden, let me ask a question that builds on what Glenn is asking. Um, how is the grace of the once for all and unique hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, how is that grace communicated to the church? How do they receive the grace of Christ in the church? Well, that... Yeah. Obviously, the the main traditional way the Catholic is going to say that, Ronner won't disagree with, and that's through the sacraments. But uh, coming out of Vatican II, that gets expanded in a huge way. So the sacraments are seven in the Roman Catholic scheme. Glenn t- believes there are three. And, you know, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Glenn, of course, <laughs> there's only two, <laughs> baptism and the Lord's Supper. But... Ah. Um, you know, the, what happens is that Rahner also starts to see that if God is giving the gift of himself, God's omnipresent, <laughs> just much like a radio station, as long as you're in range, that signal's getting presented to you. And so Rahner starts to see, and others do as well, that the whole world is a sacrament because God's grace is available everywhere not just in specific locations where a priest is um, celebrating the mass or where somebody where they're baptizing somebody. And so it's not the explicit distribution or means of grace, but it is no less real and no less bearing the power of salvation to say that that the whole world is a sacrament and sacramental because as long as you're, the question isn't so much are you a catholic in order to be in order to be saved. So in the question of salvation the question isn't specifically for Ronner are you catholic. It's better to be catholic. But the question is are you human? Right. And if you are a human whether you know it or not if you reach out beyond yourself and you try to be a better person you try to improve 
and in all the vague ways <laughs> that you want. They're, they're, none of this is really specific. It's not like he's giving us a list of specific things to do. But if if you are existential, reaching out towards the great beyond, and you know, looking outside of yourself, trying to improve and and to to become actualized and to be a better person, then even if you don't know it, you're reaching out towards Christ and you're reaching out toward the church. And so that's why an atheist or a Muslim, um, a Jew, anybody can uh, receive the grace of God, the salvific grace of God, the uncreated grace, it, just not in the forms that the Catholic Church is offering, even though ultimately Rahner views that grace is the grace of Christ, which is explicitly and concretely expressed within the Catholic Church. So you have it both ways. Yes. The uh, when I asked earlier about Amos Young and in Lonergan and Ronner, the left hand and right hand, which is an expression going back to Irenaeus, uh, the right hand is Christ, the left hand is the Holy Spirit, and the the Holy Spirit it has a wider and broader uh, ministry than Christ does in this understanding. And the, as soon as you said the world is a sacrament or is sacramental like, that's that's what. I understand uh, Amos Young to be saying about the left hand. The left mm. hand is broader. So the Holy Spirit in that thinking, the Holy Spirit is at work in the world beyond the confines of the Christian church. Mm -hmm. And why I'm, I even am aware of this is because uh, Rahner has been used to interpret Jonathan Edwards. Uh, uh. So, yeah, uh, the Catholic vision, Jonathan Edwards' Catholic vision of salvation is a book by a, a Japanese theologian by the name of Henri Morimoto. And he, he is very explicit that he's that that Rahner is the template that or the Procrustean bed, if you want to be. Yeah, uh, more like it uh, that, that he uses. And, and in that book, he gets into the created, uncreated debate between Thomas and Peter. Um, yeah. Not Abelard. Lombard. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Peter the sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, the sentences. So the so the discussion gets brought up there. So it's interesting to see how uh, the, how Rahner's influence and and uh, Morimoto was a Protestant, a Japanese Protestant theologian. Uh, but there's the the whole question of how do you handle his, the theologians from the past. And this is a question that probably would come up if we were to assess Rahner's handling of Thomas. How, how accurate is he, or does Thomas become a wax nose or, or Gumby figure uh, right. in the hands? Of, now, that's not your concern in your book. Well, no, but yeah. I allude to something because he, he was originally, he was a Jesuit, and so the Jesuits yes, tell, right. you, tell you what to go do. And he originally was studying philosophy, and his, his uh, advisor failed him because, because <laughs> of his more Heideggerian type of approach to Thomas. So he got failed. And um, that moved him off into studying theology. And then eventually his failed dissertation became, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Geist and Welt, which is a uh, uh, spirit in the, in the world, which um, is maybe his most well-known book, if not <laughs> one of the top two. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, there, there are debates even within Catholicism. Whenever you have, you know, over a billion people in your church, there's going to be diversity. Yes, yes, very true. Camden, mm -hmm. as as you reflect on Rahner and his view of Trinitarian theology, his view of man, his view of grace, the way that Christ himself is the uh, climax of the acceptance of grace and that his acceptance has these definitive implications for really uh, all of humanity. When, when you when you survey that, how has reading Rahner helped you understand Reformed theology better? Um, helped you begin? I think that comes into view, especially in the last chapter of your book. Mm. But helped you start to try to think through some of the things Rahner right. thought right. through, but in a way that helps you kind of advance and maybe even deepen. Reformed theology in light of interacting. Right. No, I think having Rahner as kind of a dialogue partner, that's a very Vatican II word, but uh, somebody to to dialogue with and, and really to sharpen my views because I get pushback from Rahner. I mean, never met him. My, my li our lives overlap four years, but uh, never 
met him, <laughs> but meeting him in his writings, uh, you know, you start to ask questions and, you know, you get pushback and you start to work at it. And I try to be fair to him and try to, to understand him on his own terms and give him the benefit of the doubt. And I, I try to be my own best critic, you know, and my most sympathetic Ron Arian, even when I'm pushing up against my ideas or my reformed confessional theology. And so I think Rahner really drove me to, to understand um, the doctrine of the Trinity much better, to understand the connection or at least the relationship between ontology and um, economy, and then to, to dive down and understand really what, like, what do the ecumenical creeds really say, and, and, and how do we take that seriously? If Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons, they really are three persons, I'm not trying to import a modern philosophical concept upon that, but if they're three persons in one essence, and there's a, a co-equality to them, there's, they're consubstantial, and God could not exist any other way. So God's not changing. He has no potency, no potentiality. And yet there's no separation. So there's no private part of Father or private part of the Son or private part of the Spirit, but they fully exhaust one another. But there's still a distinction. Three modes of subsistence. So, like, what does that? What does that really mean? And and how do we take that seriously? God's triune personality, three in one. And so, Ronner's interactions really drove me to think about that um, and tighten up my own Trinitarian theology in that way. And then to think about humanity as the image of God, and to develop what I think is a more robust doctrine of the image. And then, coupled with that, to think about receiving God's grace and being transformed, uh, being conformed into the image of Christ, um, and therefore being glorified, but not just in a one-dimensional form of glorification. We're not even just talking about glorification merely as bodily resurrection, but understanding it in terms of all its dimensions, that we become the image of Christ. Not We don't become Christ, we don't become God, but we become godly and in the fullest sense that we can possibly be as creatures. And so that's really what I try to finish off with in the last um, the polemical chapter before the concluding chapter, um, really try to develop a doctrine of glorification as what I call covenantal or aeonic, like age, aeonic image conformity, as opposed to a form of essential communication or divinization, deification, theosis. So we aren't receiving God's essence or, or coming to participate in the essence per se, but rather becoming like God. I guess that's very loosely speaking a form of participating in the essence, but I'm not talking about subsisting in the essence. We aren't brought up into the Godhead, but we have a, an image relationship to God that comes to its fullness in the resurrection. So I, I think Rahner's questions and the way he approached things caused me to to rethink and even to um, to dig deeper and and the answers I think I found are are well within are in fact you know right at the heart of Reformed theology so that's encouraging it's too a, I mean I found that my chapter, my deep deep study of Rahner even drove me to become even more Reformed and confessional not further away your your handling of Second Peter one uh, four right is uh, very helpful oh thanks yeah. I mean, I really mean that because that's the that's the one verse that that all those that that want to affirm uh, an ontological participation of some sort. That's where that's the passage they well, it's really the uh, it's the yeah, it's one the only, passage pretty much they, the only re one. they refer to because it's explicitly said you know participate in the divine nature. Um, right. So so that was very very helpful. I I think that could as i told you already could be expanded into its own book that chapter yeah. thing uh, like it, that filled it, out and it might be as i was thinking about it i think what camden's done is given us when we had our conference two years ago on the deeper protestant conception right talked uh, glenn talked about thomas so did you jeff did a wonderful job jim talked about bart I did a little bit on roman catholicism and voss i think what camden's done is helped us uh, update the discussion in terms yeah. of contemporary um, a Roman Catholic theologian of yep. the highest order. And then at the very end, I think he's given us a kind of programmatic 
deeper Protestant conception of the Visio Dei over against Rahner's unique contribution. So I think this is something for the people who've listened to that conference and are wanting yet more. This is an ideal place to turn uh, for a lot of stimulation and penetration on those issues that we covered. Mm. Very useful. Very, amen. Very well put. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, the book wouldn't have been possible without all of you. And I, I try to list you all in the acknowledgments, of course, Lane, you being my advisor, Jeff and Glenn being my close friends. Jeff, I've known you the longest out of anybody here. And, um, uh, you know, a book like this, y- y- you never ought to write a book in isolation. Books that right. theologians write on their own are <laughs> not of service to the church. And right. it takes, you know, to, to quote to quote a... a <laughs> <laughs> famous politician it takes a village, you know, to write a book. <laughs> but um, and it, it really does take a community, and I treasure that that what we what we have in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, but more broadly in Napark and and, a, and even more narrowly here at Reform Forum, the opportunity to right. to open openly, you know, express ideas sometimes to be said told very quickly by brothers, that's a stupid idea, you know, <laughs> or, <laughs> or to say, wow, that's really interesting and promising and then encourage one another, sharpen our ideas, right. you know, theology, you know, not to sound too progressive or anything, but it really does need to be developed in community. And, um, and this book, I hope uh, I, well, I know has a lot of input from a lot of people. So thank you for that too. So book wouldn't be the way it is without, without your help. Yeah. Excellent contribution, Camden. Yeah, We're I really, agree. really grateful for it. Well, thanks. I was just going to say how, how much I enjoyed reading this over my vacation. I was on oh vacation my. last week. <laughs> I apologize and to I your want, wife. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to put away my Leviticus books and <laughs> on topics I'm working on and read something I know nothing about. And so I picked up your honor book. There you go. And, and it really is superb. It's very, very clearly written, uh, easy to understand. Um, easy to follow his argument. And even when Rahner is incomprehensible himself, you clearly present his <laughs> ideas. I'm very thankful for that. I just hope Rahner would, would say so. Uh, and that it <laughs> isn't just me uh, making something up, but um, I, I, I appreciate that. Thanks. Those are, those are very kind words and, you know, uh, exceedingly kind. So I'm embarrassed now. You in see in the dissertation form of your book, you did have men who were, uh, experts and and also uh, inclined toward his way of of doing theology. Look it over. So it's not like you didn't have interaction with. Oh no! And I took a class on Rahner down at Catholic right. University of America. I can't say my external reader, who was my professor there, he's a tremendous man, uh, an expert on Rahner. I can't say that he appreciated my book entirely, but uh, <laughs> he did say that it was very clear. So I got to, I got to take that as a compliment, but I got to speak with him later at a Catholic Theological Society of America meeting. And yeah, it's there. I, I, I warmly welcome critique. If there are Ron Arians out there or other people would like to read it and give me feedback, I, I really would love that. You know, for many years or several years, I was part of the Carl Rahner Theological Society which is like a subset of CTSA. I, I think I've let my membership lapse uh, just because I haven't been able to make meetings. And so um, I don't have that venue uh, directly for, for critique and comment. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I hope they would be able to read the early chapters and say that that is Rahner's theology. And if they say my critique is way off base or crazy or no good, you know, well, we're going to have differences because I'm a confessional reform person. And then the question is, what's the Bible teach? You know, but but if if at least we can say that the that the description of Rahner's theology is accurate, that would just make my day. And that really should be all of our goal, uh, the goal for all of us when we're doing polemical theology that that the uh, the object of the polemic would would see him or herself in there and say, no, you've understood me. So, you know, anyway, well, brothers, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for taking some time in the evening it's getting late and all for all the people that are watching live and listening on facebook live i appreciate that too and apologies for uh, some of the earlier technical difficulties Hope, hopefully everything's working now and still working uh the recording is but um yeah i i appreciate that i i do want to thank pnr publishing i want to thank my editor uh, nathan shannon who did a lot of work on this over several years. I'm very thankful for him and appreciate his his keen insights and help in making the book better. I want to thank John Hughes as well. He did a lot of work. And, and Jim Scott, 
was the uh, copy editor. He caught some great stuff and was really helpful. And uh, of course, uh, forward by Chris Castaldo and then all the brothers that that um, wrote endorsements, including uh, Leonardo De Quirico, who I'm getting to know a lot better now through uh, through their podcast. And uh, let me recommend that to you too. There's a new podcast, a Reformanda Initiative. Uh, where you can uh, listen to them talking about contemporary, modern Roman Catholicism. And they talk a lot about these same issues. And he's over in Rome, and I'm going to be visiting them in June to talk about some of these things from this book. So uh, check it out, Reformanda Initiative. I'll try to put a link to that in the episode description too. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for indulging me. I want to thank all the listeners for for watching and listening. And we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.